Welcome to the ClassCast Podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Tibbins. Today, we'll be speaking with Sandy Sullivan, the president of the Loudoun Education Association, the local teacher's sort of soon-to-be union. And we're going to talk a little bit about the immediate issues facing Loudoun County Public Schools and the teachers in our local division, as well as maybe some broader issues in education, both statewide and nationally. Sandy, how are you doing today? Excellent. Thanks for having me, Ryan. I appreciate you taking the time to talk. I know that this has been a a busy year for all of us and and maybe one of the busiest years in in recent memory for the LEA. How are things going for you in that aspect of your career? Well, it's really frenzied. It's just busy all the time. And um, as much as teachers teachers and educators are spending time in front of the screen teaching, I'm spending almost sometimes as much time sitting in meetings, whether I'm participating in them or watching them. So that's one thing that's pretty equalized is it may be different what I'm doing in front of a computer, but I'm spending an enormous amount of time Zooming and all of those other video conferencing methods. Yeah, I I bet. Now, just to to be clear, are you currently a teacher or you were a teacher? Like, how does how does that work as your your role in education as you've stepped into the role of president of LEA? Does that affect your the other things you do in education? Right. So this is a full-time release position. Lawn Education Association supports a full-time release position. So I still will be able to move back into the classroom as I did before. I was the president of the association in 2007, and I was president then for five years. And then I was back in the classroom and taught kindergarten for four years and third grade for four years. And now I'm back in this position. So it's you need to be an employee and LCPS in order to be able to bring to be the president of the association. So the the first term didn't scare you off. What brought you back? I mean, obviously, obviously you care about the organization and teachers, but what for you made a leadership position desirable, especially the second time? What what brought you back to this position? Well, jo- joking and not joking aside, when I ran for president this time, this was pre-pandemic. <laughs> you know? right. I was announced as president. I mean, the, the election would have been in January. No one ran against me. So that was before the pandemic. But um, it's the whole advocacy piece, you know, finding out what people think is important and working towards making those things happen, getting their voices heard on the local level, their state legislators, all of those kind of connections that can make positive changes in education. I'm going to ask you a hard question, and and you do not feel obligated to answer this one honestly. (laughs) But (laughs) if, (laughs) if you had known what was coming with the pandemic, would that have changed any of your feelings about running for this position again? I think it could have. I mean, I it wouldn't have changed my need to be an advocate, whether I was the vice president of the association or on the board, or as people say, just a member. Um, I certainly would have been working towards advocating. But I guess knowing what there is now, I would probably would have not have been the one jumping up and down and raising my hand saying, pick me, pick me. But I'm glad I'm here as challenging as it, it is and as exhausting it is. I'm glad that I'm here and I'm doing my part to make sure that the best things are happening in the midst of all this madness. That's great. Yeah. I I talked to Ian Sorotkin, who's on the school board now, uh, just before the election, you know, when he was elected and I I don't keep up close with him, but, but we chat here and there and I've asked him that question and he, and he always gives the same, he's like, you know, I'm really glad I'm doing this and it's an important time, but it's, it's a very like measured answer where I'm like, you know, I think he still would have done it, but I think he would have had a very different feeling about it had, you know, had you known. I think this has been a little tricky for for everybody. Uh, before we get into maybe some of the details of what what we're facing in terms of both local schools and, and maybe statewide with the pandemic and the changes we're seeing in schools overall, uh, just a, a little quick background about you, maybe your education. What kind of student were you? What were your feelings about school when you were a student? And how did that lead to you, say, becoming a teacher and getting involved in LEA? Well, I will say I always enjoyed school. I was always um, a very quiet and shy student, so I've kind of branched out from those over the years, but I was always very quiet and shy and really conscientious, so I never wanted to be the one called down by a teacher, always wanted to be in my seat or whatever the task was at hand, I certainly wanted to be doing that. Um, When I went to college, I um, got a degree in early childhood education, so I've taught kindergarten through third grade minus second grade. I haven't taught that, but so... um, and I, I, I decided in 11th grade that for sure I wanted to be a teacher. I took a child development class in my high school where we planned lessons for four-year-olds and had a rotation of when we actually got to work with the students. And that's what really kind of got me fired up about becoming an educator. Okay. So, so you knew relatively early on. Um, at what point did getting involved with a teacher's association or union become attractive to you? Like, is that something that you maybe made contact with in college? Or is that something that you got more involved with once you were a teacher? 
it was something I got involved as as a teacher. My first three years of teaching, I taught in Montgomery County, Maryland. So in Maryland, you're automatically a member of the union. And when I came to Loudoun and I came to the big hoopla of the new employee orientation, you know, you get greeted by people and I automatically signed. I was a member in Maryland and I became a member of the association here. And it was a very... um, all relation based how I really got involved in the association. The second school I worked in, the librarian and I became friends quickly and she was the rep in the building. And I started going to meetings with her. I um, went to started going to National Education Association Convention and the um, Virginia Education Association. So it was all in a way very gradual. It was part of this is my friend and this is the kind of thing my friends, my friend does. And I enjoy spending time with her and I found what was so appealing to the association for her, like the advocacy and making sure that voices are heard. And that's just kind of how I slowly moved along um, through the ranks, being a board member, vice president, and then the president of the association. Yeah, that's awesome. I I also, I signed up, I think probably during that, that new employee orientation, mm-hmm. you know, that everybody's pretty smart about that. You know, like the, one of the local credit unions get their hooks in you, the Elliot, like there's all these like local things are like, if we get you now, you know, maybe we keep you. Um, and, and it's, and it's smart. And I've been, I've been a member ever since when you think about sort of the, maybe the personality types or, or maybe even the education types that, that make a person good in your role. You said that early on you were kind of a quiet student and I'm, I'm reading between the lines. So it sounds like a little bit of sort of the, the rule follower, you know, play, play, along, play along nicely with the teacher. Is that something that you think you had to change to be successful in this role? Like, is that, is that something you've had to evolve? Cause I feel like there are at least parts of your job now that require I don't know. I don't want to, I don't know that the right word is confrontation, but there has to be some element of, of pushback and sort of standing up to, to make a stand and, and do the advocacy. And so it sounds like maybe that wouldn't have come as naturally to you when you were younger. How did that evolve? Like the personality piece being comfortable in that role? I think it was really a matter of maturity and maybe it didn't really hit till um, college or even in my first um, teaching job when I was teaching in Bethesda. It was more of just becoming more mature and more sure of myself is kind of what brought me where I was. Because you're completely right. If I was this third grade student that I remember myself to be, and I still had that same personality, I would have happily been a member. I would have helped out in buildings and been a rep and helped keep people connected. But I would not have been one to ever stand up in front of the school board and give remarks or in front of um, the delegation at a convention to give remarks. So I think it was more of just a maturity and becoming more sure of myself. And I guess maybe becoming more aware of it's not just what happens in your classroom that's important. There's just so many pieces that surround the classroom that impact everything you do in the classroom. That growing awareness that I got made me um, realize what other things um, educators really can do to make positive changes. That's great. Yeah. And and I, I fully agree. That's one of the motivations of doing this podcast is that I think there's so many different ways that we could educate young people well, but there's also so many other things that influence how we do it. Like one of my best early episodes, I worked with Donna Fortier, who's the CEO of Mobile Hope in mm-hmm. Loudoun. And, you know, that's not a traditional education role, but she deals with young adult homelessness and, and students wow. in need. And I learned so much about the community through that discussion that I have a whole new appreciation for some of my students and maybe what they're going through, you know, outside of the classroom. And so I think that maybe this discussion maybe speaks to some of the things that go on from the teacher's perspectives, but outside of the classroom. When you talk to teachers, maybe who are less active members, do you feel like as as an organization, when you think about the regular membership level for the LEA, do you think that the average teacher is well-informed? Do you think that they're aware of all the things going on? Um, Because I know, you know, when I was a newer teacher, I sort of paid attention to things that hit headlines in the local paper, but I didn't really track it very closely. And as I've gotten older, I pay far closer attention. What do you think the the membership of this organization is like in terms of their attention to maybe some of the political aspects of their job or of the LEA in general? I think it really runs the gamut. There are people that seem to, as soon as I make them, it's clear that they've been very active and very aware of what's going on for many years. And there's many people who say, oh, I'm just a member. I'm happy to just be a member. and glad you do the things that you do for us. So there's really the gamut. And there's lots of people that obviously in this time of the pandemic and all these decisions the school board members were making, I'm assuming, 
and I'm, it's probably a pretty fair assumption that there are people who are watching school board members who have been at Alvin County Public Schools for a very long time and never attended or watched a school board meeting. And now there's all of this focus on that, which is really exciting that people are really seeing how decisions are made. It's, it's not just hearing a report from somebody, you know, a day later or the next week when your principal gives an update about something. It's people are really involved in what's going on and aware. And there's people, you know, sending emails that never would have bothered doing that or showing up to speak at school board meetings or now signing up to do that virtually. So there's educators in all walks of no matter what their um, role is in the school system. And that's one term I try to be really careful is that we're an education association. So LEA represents educators. So that's not just teachers. So that's any school employee that can be your, that is your custodians, your librarians, your teaching assistants, the whole gamut of any school employee is an educator because in one way or another, they impact what's happening in the lives of the students that are in the classrooms. That's good. I love that, that approach too, because, you know, I think it was maybe my third year, te- second, third year teaching. I used, to, I used to spend a lot of time there after school as a new teacher. Like the last people in the building were like the custodians and me a lot of times, you know, at least a Absolutely. few nights a week. And, and it didn't take too long before I realized that, you know, aside from it, maybe the principal, and, and I'm not even sure I'd put the principal at the top, but like the people who really both literally and figuratively open all the doors to the school are the, are the front office secretaries and the, and the custodians. Like if if you're in good with, with the front desk and the custodial staff, you have, you know, almost a free run in a building. Um, And so it's important not to, to overlook those people who perform really important roles. Now for the rest of what you said, I would agree. I think that a lot of people have a, a new awareness of maybe the political, political aspects of education and some of these decision-making processes and I think sort of, as you said, I think it's a good thing overall, but I also, I have a concern because I see, you know, a lot of the, the teacher discussions and, and, and other educator discussions through like some of the new Facebook groups and things like that, where I see a lot of people stating very strong opinions that maybe don't have context for them. You know, I, th- I think that some people have, and, and for some people, I think it started maybe last year with the, um, some of the challenges to the diverse classroom libraries. There were some book issues. And I think for a lot of people, it started right around then. There were some questions about new textbook adoption. And then, you know, a year later, a year and a half later, we roll into a pandemic and a shutdown. And I think between those two things, a lot of people are paying far closer attention to those school board meetings than ever did before, which, as you said, is a good thing. But I also think that sometimes we're hearing very strong opinions that don't have like historical context to them. And I'm not going to pretend to be an expert. You know, Um, I've been paying attention for a while, but I am far from the most knowledgeable person on it. But I also try to keep that in mind when I state my opinion, like there there might be a, a backdrop to this that I don't fully understand. Do you feel as though, and this is not specific to educators, you can think about parents, you know, the, the, the administrative staff in the schools, things like that. Do you feel as though these discussions are being held in a healthy way? Like there's always going to be some troublemakers or some loud voices, but do you feel like the conversations about what we're doing in our schools right now are going well, or are those louder, angrier voices winning out right now? Like, how does that look from your position? Well, there's a whole lot wrapped around that. I mean, if we're talking about in person or the public comment that's happening, there's certainly a lot more people speaking up and urging the school system to get the students back into the buildings, back into in-person instruction. And um, those are really loud and passionate voices, and they have their right to be heard just like everybody does. Um, One of my biggest concerns was we used to have plenty of people who would show up to a school board meeting who would speak, whether it's for the budget or a particular issue. And as soon as the school board meetings became, the public input of school board meetings became virtual, um, became in-person, during the pandemic, that was a real concern for people who, um, you know, for for their own safety, they were not um, going to be wanting to work in the building. So they certainly didn't want to go into a situation where they're in the admin building. So that was one way that I think some voices really got silenced because there would be people who would more than happy sit in front of their computer at home and log in like we are now again doing for school board meetings. So that really kind of took away some of the voices that would have happily shown up after work one day on a first school board meeting and spoken. Another piece you're talking about people um, kind of debating or sharing their ideas. Lots of that stuff is happening on Facebook where it's really hard, Facebook and other social media, where it's, it's, it's really hard to have a conversation and to make sure all the best information is getting out there. 
you know, there's some fiery voices in one direction or the other. And it's just harder on social media to kind of have a conversation and really see that, oh, that's why you all are believing this. Like educators in Loudoun County, they want to be back in their work sites. They are not, some are having great successes with distance learning, but they want to be back in their work sites. It's not a matter of it's easier to be at home and I'd rather be at home sitting in front of a computer. It's they believe that's the safest thing for them and their families and their students. So it's just really hard when there's not as much um, more potential in-person discussion like there could be and there used to be at school board meetings after public comment and such where you could talk to somebody who obviously didn't agree with you and you could have a true back and forth conversation when you know, you're typing behind a keyboard, it's not the flow and the connection that you'd have otherwise in person. Yeah, I think I think we have a lot of local, well, I mean, everywhere, but locally specifically, we have a lot of keyboard warriors, um, both from from the, 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 say, the people who want schools to stay online and from the people who want, you know, who want to go there. And this is something I learned, I don't know, early in my teaching career, I had a back and forth with a parent to, and I kept sending like these, like the most thoughtful, clear email I could. And they're three quarters of a page long. And I'm explaining every detail of the situation. I'm trying to help your kid. Here it is. And I would get the angriest, most irrational responses. And I'm like, I don't know. So I like, I went to the principal. I'm like, look, I don't know. What, what do you, what am I doing here? And, and she said, just call. Yep, just said, pick up the phone. She said, just pick up the phone and call. I'm like, I, I said, it's just, it's hard to find a quiet place and a time to do it. I said, the email I can answer at my leisure. And she goes, yeah, but the parents doing the same thing. And that means they have time to read your response, think about it for a little bit. They get themselves riled up and then they respond. She said, I bet if you call, you will find a very like sincere and kind person who's just upset about the specific situation and blah, blah, blah. And so, you know, and I made the call and I, it was amazing. It was like, I was literally talking to a different person. And so sometimes I see these conversations going on online and I think, man, you know, I know pandemic makes this difficult, but it would be awesome if those people could just meet in person, and have the discussion, because I don't think the tempers would flare as fast. Not that they would automatically agree, but um, it's, not always the healthiest way to have these discussions. And I think that sometimes that sours the conversation itself. Like we, there's a lot of animosity from some people in the community towards others in places that shouldn't be there. You know, I, I find myself constantly saying, guys, same team, same team. Like everybody's, <laughs> everybody's trying to say what we, you know, what's best for students, what's best for school right now. Um, and we can reasonably or respectfully disagree on the way to get there. But man, it seems like it's awfully easy for people to drop that sort of, you know, that respectful piece. Um, in your interactions with members of the LEA, are you experiencing any of that? Like, do you feel like people are angrier, say, pointed towards other teachers or pointed, pointed towards the association itself than in the past? Or are you feeling like people are supportive of the organization? Like, I don't know. I just I just see a lot of anger going in a lot of directions. And I think that everybody's getting a few extra nasty emails that maybe we would have a year ago. Is that true of the association? Or is that really more people asking for information? Like what's what's the what's the temperature of that conversation? I think it's definitely true that there's more anger towards the association, what's happening in the schools or not, than for example, that I could say that I remembered when I was president in 2007 for five years then. So, but then this is certainly more volatile situation than looking back when I was president before, I'm not sure what was, you know, we, we were at that time, we were going through lots of salary freezes and those kind of things, which were very stressful and concerning and, you know, uh, ways for educators to really feel like they're not valued. And, but it wasn't a matter of, do I feel safe going into my building? Do I feel safe working with my students? And so it's a whole nother level here. So I'm not surprised that there's so much anger and passion behind this. So it comes on both ends is thank you so much for standing up and saying this or, you know, giving the survey and making sure that you know what, um, what's important to me as an educator. So it does, it goes on both sides of that, the whole fireness that this should have happened already, or, you know, I believe that we should be in schools. Why aren't you advocating for that? And, and that's an answer question I've had to answer a lot of times. And that's why we do surveys in those things. So we have the temperature of what our membership believes is important because when it comes to broad based um, activities, we can't represent every member. If you wanna make sure that you're in your classroom and other people wanna make sure that they are safe and that they're not in the buildings until things are safe, 
there's no way to advocate for all of that at once. And that's why we do surveys so that we know what the temperature is and that the majority of our members are saying they want to be in, back in the work sites, but that they want it to be safe. Right. And the yeah, right and, protocols and, need to be in place. Yeah. And how do you, how could you possibly advocate for two opposed positions? <laughs> you know right. what I mean? I mean, you could do it, but then everyone just says, well, we don't have to listen to them anymore. Um, when, when you do the surveys, when you get that information, how much of the LEA's position on any given issue, like we can use the return to school, but on, on any issue, how much of that is dictated by say the survey versus the positions held by the Virginia Education Association or like the VEA or the NEA, do they have influence into the local organization's positions on some of these topics or are we 100% just majority rules within the county? Like what's that dynamic? Well, I can't say that I've ever felt like any or VEA has pushed down on LEA and said, this is what you need to advocate for. The thing is, it seems that we often just agree how that is. Um, it was interesting, The I guess it was Tuesday when the email went out and schools were, um, LEA, LCPS schools were returned to, will be returning to distance learning on Tuesday. That same day, the president of the Virginia Education Association was quoted in an article in the Post, along with the whole thing that was happening with LCPS. So we're often in tandem, but it's not like we're dictated to have these positions. Right. Yeah. And I asked that because I think that for people who are in the association, sometimes there's not a lot of awareness of how the decisions are made. But I also think that for the teachers who are not members or for other community members who aren't, but, you know, just say, hear a quote from you in, in like the local paper, or they hear someone representing the association, you or someone else speak at a school board meeting. And so I think that sometimes there's a disconnect just in, you know, who are they representing? How are these decisions made? Um, because I think, you know, politically, there's a lot of, I would depend, depending on, you know, where you are politically, but I think there's a lot of anti-union sentiment from at least, you know, some people in the country. And so I think that sometimes that crosses over into the discussion of local schools where some people would just say, well, that's the union. I won't listen to anything they say, whereas some people are so pro, you know, they'll just agree with anything. So I, I think that for some people, the concept of unions is so daunting that they maybe don't want to engage with the LEA. Um, and I don't think that's fair, but I do think that that's maybe a battle that I assume you have to fight sometimes. As you think about the changes to the state laws and and the, the state legislature voted, I, I think last year, to allow for collective bargaining for public employees. Now, Virginia is a right to work state, so there's nothing that would compel a person to join a union, but they have now allowed or, or cleared the way for collective bargaining for public employees. And that was delayed because of the pandemic. But I, I believe if all goes well, uh, governor is going to give the thumbs up and collective bargaining can can begin, I think, in May of 2021. May 1st, correct. May 1st. Mm -hmm. So how has that affected the Loudoun Education Association in terms of, of allowing for collective bargaining? What does that mean for us locally? So what that means, well, first of all, let me tell you what we already have in place. So the Loudoun Education Association has had a compensation climate committee and probably long before I started teaching in Loudoun, and I've been in Loudoun 27 years, but there was a small committee of members who would get together and put together a compensation package of things they would like to see in the budget, for example, salary increases, other things that would um, impact the budget, like class size, and then policies and those sorts of things. Like when I was president before, um, we worked on a workday policy and... Um, hmm. At the moment, I can't think of what the other one was. But so it's a it's a package of um, things that we would like to see incorporated into the next budget or as part of what becomes part of the school board plans and in terms of adopting policies and such. So that's something that's already in place. It was in place when Dr. Hatrick was um, the superintendent and it's continued through with Dr. Williams. And actually our committee just met with Dr. Williams and some admin staff um, Thursday evening. So that what happens is we have a conversation there and then that package is presented to the school board um, and then the committee works on lobbying for those particular items. So that's something that's already in place. That's a very powerful way for the school system to hear what um, educators in Loudoun think is important. The, um, the limitations to that is it's a conversation. We can lobby people, uh, school board members, and it can become part of the budget and part of their plan or it might not. Now, if we were to gain collective bargaining in Loudoun, then there would be a um, binding document. So whatever's agreed upon by both sides 
would be in place. It's not just a lobbying and some will vote for it and some won't. When the agreement happens at the table, then whatever is decided actually is in place. So in order for collective bargaining to happen, um, whichever employee group or groups that we work towards becoming the bargaining agent for starting in um, May is we need to have 50% plus one of that membership. So the next task for us is to get um, commitment cards signed. Commitment cards are what tells us and would tell the school board that um, those employees want LEA to be the bar their bargaining um, group for them in the years to come. So when you say 50% plus one, does that mean 50% plus one of all all the employees or 50% plus one of any employee who joins any organization. So like if 50% of the, the school, just like, I'm not doing any of it. Do you need to get 50% of the remaining people who will be joining some organization? Or are we talking about total employment? Total employment. So 50% of all LCPS teachers, for example, all LCPS teaching assistants, whatever employee group that we would um, choose to focus on. And do you know what the current number is? We are very close in terms of certified staff, in terms of teaching staff. We are not at 50% plus one yet. All of the other um, classified employee groups are much smaller than that. So there's two things that need to happen there is growing membership so that we have greater numbers of members, and which is important all the time, not just because collective bargaining is on the, on the table. It's important all the time to gain new members and retain our members and get them active. But two parts is gaining membership, as well as even if people choose not to join the association, for them to sign the commitment card saying, yes, I want LEA to bargain on my behalf, on my employee group behalf. Okay, so someone could actually say, yes, I'm fine with them doing the bargaining, but no, I'm not going to join and pay the dues and whatever. So so Th that can happen, correct. Obviously not ideal, but would be better than, it's better than nothing, but not the ideal circumstance. Do right now, and I just, I don't know the answer to this. Do the classified staffs, the like custodial staffs, other, other people working in the schools, do they pay the same rate that teachers pay? And is that, or do they like, do they get a discount? Because in most cases there's a noticeable difference in compensation. So if they make less money, you know, obviously what I'm paying, you know, is already healthy enough, you know, and, and goes to a good cause. Sure. But if they're asked to pay the same, I can see how that could be a deterrent. Do they pay the same rates or is, is that even allowed to adjust depending on a person's job? Classified employees pay half the dues as a full-time classified employees pay half the dues as a full-time certified employee. Okay. Yeah, that's good. And I think that's probably a, a big step in the right direction. Now you did mention, you know, there are other groups, you know, available and, and involved in some of this. And I'm sure you're aware that I think at least one or two, you know, Facebook groups have popped up talking about, you know, what the LEA is or isn't doing. And while they say they're not advocating for another another organization, I think that very quietly they are. And I've tried to gently ask questions about that. And I usually get either, either a very short non-response or something a little bit rude implying that I'm somehow shilling for the LEA or something. And I'm just like, I just want to understand what the motivations are. I'm happy to be a part of the conversation. Um, but, you know, it, it sounds like that there's at least a, at least a small push from people who, I don't understand. I know at least one has a personal a personal problem with the organization, and that has maybe spun into something that's taking over a little bit on Facebook. Do you do you sense any any pressure from say like the the AFT, the American Federation of Teachers, or any of the other union organizations? Because I, up to this point, none of them have any sort of stronghold in the county. There's very 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 low membership for most of those. But with the possibility of collective bargaining, it certainly gives them an incentive to try to get more involved. And at least a few employees, like I said, have been, I think, slyly trying to promote that. Is the main sort of strategy right now just boost the numbers and sort of disregard? Or is that something that the LEA has to be aware of? Like, how, how much do you worry about competition versus how much is this just stick to our mission and, and do what we're doing? I think we need to be doing both at the same time. So being very aware of what or other organizations are doing, what kind of traction they have, and those sorts of things while still keeping um, our focus on getting those members and getting those commitment cards signed so we can be the bargaining agent. So it's not excluding one or the other, it's keeping both in mind so we can move forward 
to become yeah, the bargaining agent. I know, and I don't. I have no idea what the numbers look like, but I know that you know our neighbors to the east in Fairfax. They have at least two education associations that have a, a, at least somewhat sizable membership. And so I've talked to some friends who work there, and they say, you know, everybody's going to kind of have to decide. And so I don't. And I don't know the dynamics of how that works in Loudon. We don't really have that. We sort of have the one association. But now, you know, with the opportunity for actual collective bargaining, I assume that that increases the incentives for other people to get involved. Um, I don't know. I just, I, I, I'm i generally supportive, personally, personal bias. I'm generally supportive of the concept of unions, though I don't think they're perfect. I would rather have collective bargaining than not. But I also think, you know, we need to be careful with how we sort of wield that that power or how we use that tool. But I think the dynamics are so different from location to location that it's it'll be interesting to see how many how many counties in the state actually end up collectively bargaining because the membership numbers are so different and the numbers of organizations are so different. Um, since you, you know, also are attending VEA you know, activities and meetings, things like that. What, what's, what's that discussion like statewide? Like are, are most people thinking that, Hey, this is going to happen. We're going to have collective bargaining by the summer or are people maybe a little more conservative in their, in their hopes? Like how, how quickly is this going to happen for a lot of places in the state? Well, I think the first piece of good news is is um, any group that would not be named the bargaining agent for any association, it doesn't mean if they're not this coming May 1st, it doesn't mean there's not an option continuing to work on that. So it's not like it's a one-shot deal. So any local or if they were not to have the amount of membership that they needed and the amount of commitment cards, that doesn't mean if by May 1st that that's off the table forever. It's just they need to continue their efforts, maybe refocus and decide what's best so that they have that opportunity in later years. So that's- So it's an on, it's ongoing, like- It is ongoing. So, so it's so ongoing. It so if somebody, associ- right. So if we don't have the 50% plus one in May, but we get to it next year sometime, that's still an active option. And if another organization made the push and didn't get there, they could continue, right? So right. So, so it's not a, it's not a, a one and done. Um, so it works for education, any education association or any group, as well as any employee group. So for example, if we were to pick um, a couple classified employee groups and um, in one of those that we didn't end up with enough commitment cards, that doesn't mean that they're off the table. That would just mean to continue that work for the following year. Okay. Um, what do you foresee as as maybe the changes that would happen? Like, let's let's say optimistically, LEA gets enough cards, and in May or June we have that collective bargaining right. What will that mean for, say, you know, local teachers and school employees in the next year or two? Like, is that is that actually going to make any noticeable change in the short term to say compensation or, or rights in the classroom, anything like that? Like. I guess what I'm asking is if if step A is get the cards and get the collective bargaining, what's the next step? What is the goal at that point? So then it is coming to the table, the um, the bargaining group from the for the educator side as well as the LCPS's side, the school board side, and um, coming to agreements on salaries or whatever is put on the table. So it is very possible that there's concrete things that happen for next budget cycle for you know the following year to make those changes. And it all depends on who's at the table and what is able to be agreed upon between the school board and the bargaining agent. Okay. I mean, I'm just going to, I've been telling everyone who will listen, you know, aside from safe return to school and of course, you know, fair compensation, I think I am moving the Monday workday to the top of my list (laughs) as a high school English teacher. I'm still behind on grading, but at least I have a fighting chance, you know, and and I think that there's some places in the country that have, have played with their schedules. And I'm always like, man, that, that would be the first thing I'd ask for. I don't think it would happen, but that, that really creates an interesting dynamic and a chance for kids to get extra help. Um, And the reason I bring that up is, is not so much because I think it's actually going to happen say for next year, but in my view, collective bargaining gives the possibility for educators to have a greater influence in some of those policy decisions. You're like, that could be a thing we can all say, Hey, we'd like, but when you actually have a seat at the table rather than say, just standing in the room, then it gives you the ability to actually work towards the goal rather than just keep floating the idea until, you know, somebody else picks it up. Absolutely. Uh, Right. Whether with or without collective bargaining in May, what are the short-term goals of the LEA? Like, what are the things that you're hoping to accomplish maybe through this year or, you know, in, in the coming months? So um, I think we have a very good opportunity now to get the questions that we've been concerned about all along since schools were shut down in um, March 
that those questions that weren't answered, those protocols that weren't in place, those sorts of things, we have that time now that everyone's returning to distance learning to get those questions answered. So when we're all back in the work sites, those things can happen. So for example, one big concern is with cleaning protocols and um, the Virex, there's very certain directions for how that needs to be administered. That's the cleaning agent for the um, hard surfaces. And in some situations, the schedules that are in place were not allowing for the proper cleaning to happen. The, the Virex is supposed to be on the um, hard surfaces for 10 minutes. And in many cases, there weren't 10 minutes between classes switching over, whether you're talking in a, um, with older students, you know, with those kind of turnovers in the schedules or like with specialists. So now there's time to make sure that those schedules have the amount of time built in so the proper cleaning protocols can be in place. Um, lots of things that have um, protocols haven't been particularly enforced. So now there's time before students are, before students and employees are back in school to go back and revisit what was working well, which work sites were really handling the mitigation strategies just like they should be. And let's find out how they were doing that and make sure they're sharing those with the buildings that weren't doing that and find out why it wasn't, you know, more broad based. It was, you know, I've heard some very good positive things from some work sites where um, all the employees are feeling safe and all those cleaning procedures are in place. And then there's lots of places where those strategies aren't in place and educators don't know what to do or don't feel like they're supported when they're not in place. So we have that opportunity right now to make those positive changes. Yeah. And that, you know, I, I think in this case, obviously, the discussion is a little bit different because this is about, you know, a very short time frame and, and cleaning the rest. But I do think that in a broad sense, in a larger school division like we are with so many different schools, I think that that's one of the reasons that I like that there's some flexibility between schools. You know, I don't necessarily love a ton of top down direction just because when everyone does everything the same way, it gives very little room to find a better way to do it. Like if each principal is given the authority to do things a little differently school to school, it means that you're going to find some things that work better. And then the mat, then it's share that information. If everything's restricted and, and guided very tightly, then everyone does the same thing, which is good if we made a perfect decision, but it means that you don't necessarily have the opportunity to see what works better and worse. Now, in a situation like this, where it directly affects people's health, obviously we just, we wanna figure out what works best and everybody do that. You don't want variability there, but if we've already had these same measures in place and some schools have found things that are working better, you know, that that's where that that ability to have the variability and then share that information is, is important. Um, Aside from maybe the, the cleaning protocols, um, I'm I've, I've heard talk, and and I don't know how you can tell me that this is not a major issue, and I, I would I'd take your word for it, but I've heard a lot of concerns about um, concerns about childcare for teachers, and then when we're online, are schools still going to be open for students to attend, and like use sort of like the internet cafe or you know access special services things like that? Um, have you been involved in discussions about you know either either childcare or students being able to work in schools? Is that something that we have a clear goal on, or is that just sort of a we're, we're, we're making the best that we can at each turn. Cause I mean, that, that's the thing I've learned most is that I just, I'm not making any long-term plans I, in March. I just decided I'm just going to take each one week at a time. And I think that served me well, but you know, it, from a policy position, it's difficult to survive that way. So childcare, um, students access to the building, special services, what's the LEA's take on those topics? So we educators need to make sure that they can focus on their teaching jobs. So whatever that means um, for you know daycare, we want to see that in place. We want to also make sure that if folks need to be on leave because of their own health or the health of someone in their family, that the right protocols are in place and the right structures are in place. So that can happen. We want people who are able to continue to do their job, but at a, are able to do that at a distance, should be able to do that when there's at least hybrid, the hybrid education going on. So like for that, if say we, you know, as a high school teacher, say I return to school at some point, you know, whatever, next few weeks, next few months, who knows? Um, and I'm teaching and maybe I don't get sick, but I am in close contact with say a student in my room who does test positive. So then I have to quarantine. Does that mean essentially that we're advocating for the position that I would be able to continue to teach the class from home virtually, as opposed to taking leave? Like, what, what, how is that going to play out? Do you think? Because um, I know a lot of people have concerns. Like, if I'm healthy enough to come in and do work, but they tell me I have to stay home, do I have to take my own leave if I get sick? 
because of contact with a student. If I actually, you know, if I actually contract the virus while in school, do I have to take my own leave, et cetera? Do we already have policies in place for that? Or is that something that we're still figuring out? Well, that's what the school system says they have in place. So if you are need to be at home because you've been exposed and you are able to continue working from home, then the goal is to have a substitute in the building in person. So that can happen. Okay. Yeah. That, I don't know. There's just so many like weird variability, you know, weird options of things that can happen here. And while, you know, when each one pops up, like I can take a minute and think about it and say, I think this is what would be best. I think it's really hard sometimes to predict all of those eventualities, like all the different variables that can occur. And I think that that makes it very difficult when the, say the school board or upper administration is working through those issues, where does LEA come into that conversation? Like, is that from the moment someone raises the issue, LEA is part of the discussion? Or is it that upper administration forms a proposal and say when they're pitching it to the school board, LEA gets involved then? Like, at what point does the LEA become a part of that conversation right now? Well, most often there's questions that we get from members or we either ask a question or this is the situation I'm in. And then we can take that to the department, whichever it might be, HRTD or whomever, to get questions answered, with it, whether it's a leave issue or something like that. So then we can get questions answered or move things up the chain so we can find out. So is this the, you know, whatever this member is experiencing, is this the way it should be going? Is this what the protocol is in Loudoun County? If it is and it's not the best for our membership and our students, then we're going to be advocating for appropriate change there. So lots of times it's us reaching out when there's a um, issue that we're made aware of from a member. So, okay. So active membership is really important in, in making sure that information is all available. In terms of maybe longer term goals, and I know that this is maybe the wrong time, just <laughs> in the middle of a pandemic, it's tough to think long-term, but what are some of the long-term goals the LEA has for say over the next few years, what are the things that we might be talking about or hoping to accomplish? Well, one thing, I'm not sure if this fits into short-term or long-term, but we have asked and we expect to be a part of the decision of um, getting our next superintendent in place. Um, I know when Dr. Williams, before Dr. Williams was hired, the president of the association at that time was part of those meetings and those discussions. So we have asked for and expect to be a part of that. So that may be considered more of a short-term goal. I know no, that- that's, that's probably, that was actually going to be my next question is what is the role in that? Because, you know, it's fine to have long-term goals, but when you bring in new leadership, sometimes those goals start to look more or less realistic, you know? And so do you, do you have any idea what the timetable for that is? I know they're going to name, they're going to an name interim. A, an interim superintendent, I think, I think this week, right? Or, or very soon. Yeah. They say in December. So I would think it would be Tuesday since that's their last school board meeting. Right. Yeah. That, that's, I mean, you know, I'm just taking them at their word. They said December. So I'm like, it should be this week. Right. Um, is, is that something like, do we hope to have a new permanent superintendent named during the school year? Is that like a summer thing? Is there a timetable or, or no? It's my understanding is that can be a year. It can be, I think what I've heard is like a nine month to over a year process because there's a whole, um, Oh, right. Yeah. They, they the hire search. like a consultant group to do a that, national that's the word, consultant. Yes. Yeah. That, so like a that's, national. That would you know. be, that's, that's already in place, meaning that's what's going to happen. I can't say I know where they are along the pieces of that. But one thing our government relations committee, LEA's government relation committee does is works on developing relationships with school board members. So that's one thing when we talk to school board members, we say, we want to make sure that we're a part of this process. That's great. Now, for actually, I guess I have a membership question. I've never really thought about are school based administrators. Are they allowed to be members of LEA? Like can a principal be a member of the LEA or once you move to administration, you're no longer eligible. No, any school, any school employee can join. So substitutes and any, any role you have in LCPS, you can. So could in theory, could a superintendent join? Yes. Okay. I mean, that that's interesting. I don't know if Politically, I don't know if it's like a good or a bad decision, but I, I, I don't know. I know that like my mother, she worked for the state of Pennsylvania growing up. And when she moved into a managerial role, she was no longer eligible to be in the union because once mm -hmm. you moved into like a supervisor's role, it changed. So I didn't know how that worked. Um, so like, here's something. Dr. Hatrick was very involved in the education yeah. association before he um, took over as superintendent. Okay. And then, so aside from superintendent, which is probably a top priority for, I think a lot of people right now, because that's, it's going to influence a lot of, a lot of 
things that we do and how we do them in the coming years. Do we have anything else on the agenda that the board's hoping to accomplish in, in the coming years? Well, I think one thing that's really important, and it's been an ongoing goal, but now, as we talked about earlier, how more people seem to be more involved in paying attention to what's going on at the school board level, for example, we really want to get those folks really involved. So not just watching the meetings every two weeks and those sorts of things, but making sure they're reaching out to their school board members and emailing their school board members. We get lots of times, um, we get emails in the office and, you know, this is my concern and I want LEA to work on this. And that's certainly something LEA can work on. But another important piece of that is making sure individuals are contacting their school board members. So the school board members are hearing from a variety of people and hearing all of the nuances because one part of my job is advocating for, you know, the bigger picture, but what's really important for school board members to hear is those individual stories. This is how it's impacting me. You know, this is happening in my room and this is how it's impacting me as an educator or my students, for example. So the the focus on getting folks to really write those emails and speak out um, and show up to school board meetings when, well, when, sh- when showing up at school board meetings is a thing we can do again, but speaking at school board meetings remotely like is in place now getting people involved in what's happening statewide. Our government relations committee works um, and is a part of the lobby day, which happens through VEA every year, which is going to look very different than it has in past because it will be virtual. It used to be a day that we'd give LEA members leave and we would go down to Richmond and we would set up meetings and be in conference rooms or offices with individual senators or um, delegates. So that's something that we just want to get people more involved so that we're hearing lots of voices and lots of specific stories, because it's really important when the decision makers hear what it really means on the ground to those folks, however it's impacting them, whatever their job is with the school system. Great, great. Now, a lot of this, you know, has to do with obviously promoting, promoting teachers, you know, uh, safety in schools and fair compensation and, and job security and, and ideally the quality of the job. Um, I, I mean, in a moment, I'm going to ask you about what you think your ideal school is, but I'm, I'm curious. And, and again, this is one, feel free to not answer bluntly. <laughs> I just, cause I, I don't know, you know, sometimes, sometimes I find myself like, I think a thing, but I don't say it on the podcast cause I still have a job and a boss, you know? And so <laughs> you have to be measured sometimes, but I, I hear people use the phrase a lot that what's good for students is good for teachers, or we usually say it in reverse. What's good for teachers is what's good for students. And I personally think that that's usually true, but I think there are probably exceptions given that your role is specifically advocating for the, the school-based employees, obviously we want to do what's best for the students, but your specific job description is really advocating for those employees first. Where do you, where do you sort of fall on that continuum? Do you believe that hundred percent that what's best for the teacher is always what's best for the student? Are there times where there are exceptions to that? Because I hear the line a lot and I think it's nice if you don't think too hard about it, but there probably are at least a few exceptions as the head of an education association how does that impact your decision-making like that balance between the teacher and the student? Well, I will tell you, that's not something that really bubbles up very often. Usually what um, members think they need for themselves or for their classrooms really are what's best for what's happening in their classrooms. For example, Um, one way we put things is that um, the employees working conditions are the students learning environment. So if we're keeping those things in mind, we're going to have a positive outcome. Yeah. That's good. I, in, in the second episode I did and the first few episodes I did, I had great conversations and they're really still a little bit embarrassing as a podcast. So I'm still learning like, you know, how to record and ask the questions or whatever. But I, I interviewed a former student of mine, Esther Kim in the second, in the second episode. And she remembered, cause she graduated, I forget, maybe 2010, somewhere around there. And she remembered how, how, so many of her teachers were just so like, you know, upset about not getting paid because that was right as the recession was hitting as she's finishing high school. And so she said that there were a lot of teachers that, that, you know, just under their breath or were grumbling at their desk, you know, upset about not getting paid or, you know, during budget time, you have a lot of people who are upset and things like that. And so when I asked her what would make schools better, she was very quick to say, pay the teachers more. And I was like, well, I'm a teacher. I love that. But why do you think that would actually work? And then she said, you know, she had concerns about teacher motivation or that the teachers did the teaching well, but she felt like some teachers weren't going that extra yard to make relationships with students. And she felt, and I don't know that this is entirely fair, but her personal experience was that she felt like the teachers felt so discouraged about their work and their pay 
that in some cases relationships with students suffered. And then she turned around and she complimented me. So I was like, well, I'm not going to disagree with any of it now, but you know, <laughs> but I said, you know, that's, I think that's a fair concern for her. Her experience as a student was significantly impacted, or at least the way she thinks back on it was impacted by the way the teachers felt about their work. And I, on one hand, I want to say that those teachers need to make sure they're being professionals and, and you don't do that in ways that make a, a student feel bad or, you know, not that you can't have the conversation. That's just, you have to be careful with the tone. But on the other hand, I think there's some truth to it. If you don't feel good about your work or if you don't feel like you're valued, then that's going to affect your work. How important in the grand scheme of things, like if we had to rate, we're not going to do this, but if we had to rate issues from one to 10, does compensation fall at or near the top every year? Or does that, is that a piece that sort of comes and goes depending on what the budget is proposed? Like that's usually what people go straight to is pay the teachers, which is great if you're a teacher. But I'm just wondering from an association perspective, is that always near the top of the priority list or does that sometimes vary? No, it is typically at the top or not or near the top. And um, some years we do surveys um, surrounding items that would be part of the budget, whether it's you know class size and those sorts of things. And I remember at least one year when I was president previously that in the survey that we did, class size came up as number one and salaries came up as number two. And that was a time when one way to balance the budget when a school board adopts a budget and then it goes to the supervisors and then there's cuts made to that, an easy, easy meaning in terms of money way to reconcile the budget is to increase class sizes. And that's what would happen sometimes. So class sizes were much bigger than they had been, you know, a couple years previous to that. So yeah, salaries is typically at the top or near the top. But like I said, I can particularly remember um, class size being one when I was president. Yeah. Formally. And I mean, and they're almost the same thing in a way. And again, I'm speaking from my perspective as a high school English teacher, like the, the hardest and probably the worst part of my job is grading papers. Not, I don't mind grading five. It's just when I have 105 and I don't have time to do this in school. And if I'm actually going to read it, I don't have time to do it. So for me, class size is pay because for every extra kid you add, that's an extra five minutes on an extra essay. And if you add an extra kid across five classes, then, you know, and I'm doing this work at home and I'm like, well, I'm not, I'm not paid for that time. I'm doing it at home. So in the end, you know, I don't know if anyone else would agree with this, but I would, in some cases, in some years, I would probably forego a step increase to drop the number of kids in my class by four or five, because in the end, my quality of life is going to be affected in the same way. Like the money's great, but sometimes decreasing that workload just a little bit has the same net effect, you know, and that, that's why I was just curious about sort of the priorities of it, because sometimes those things, not that they're interchangeable, but they have similar impacts on the teacher and if we're saying we want happy, motivated teachers, then sometimes you can get to the, the same end result in different ways. Um, now for you personally, so if uh, shift gears here, if you were given free run to start your own education institution, so, you know, school, uh, you know, whatever, whatever that may be, think like private school, charter school, where you have a, a budget, a building, a staff of your choosing, but very little legal oversight. Like as long as the kids are learning and not dying, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> what would your ideal school look like? Well, it's funny. So when I received the question today and I thought, you know, I've never really thought very broadly about that. But the more I spent some time on it, thinking about it this morning, is I can think of lots of instances where I thought, you know, this situation would have been better if educators were asked first. If this wasn't something that came from the admin building or this wasn't something that the state was bringing down on classrooms. So my thought is that usually that there needs to be, not usually, there needs to be more educator input. They're the ones that are, you know, on the front lines dealing with the students. And so when decisions are made way above the classroom level, there's probably some thoughts there that people are, those people making those decisions are using old ideas from their old experiences or experiences that they never had and are making assumptions. So making sure educators are um, consulted and asked what do they think they need and that are a part of the planning of um, whatever those changes are or whatever needs to be implemented. I think that's key. And I would like to see that to be a broad, that would be part of a, um, of a school that would be more effective and probably um, very well run. Another part is when is when it comes to being able for educators to have more latitude. I know sometimes when you're teaching whatever grade it is, you're worried about getting through this unit or this skill so you can move on to the next one and get that box checked. And I remember when I first started teaching, 
and there wasn't quite as much push on the SOLs, there was all sorts of really fun things. For example, I would do in my third grade classroom and we did ancient civilizations. And that's the kind of stuff that kind of started fading away is there was more push on how um, the SOL scores turned out. So being able to really not do this surface level of um, teaching of whatever the subject is and making sure there is room to enrich and expand that. So there's really a greater understanding and a lot of times a lot more fun that goes along with that. That's great. You know, and I think both of those are are awesome, both in a current school dynamic, or even if you were to create, you know, a different sort of platform through a charter school or something, having, having teachers involved, do you think it would be, you know, and some schools do this. Do you think that students should be involved in the decision-making as well? Like if you were going to have teachers have a little more autonomy in the classroom, that's a great thing. Assuming you have very good teachers, you know, we always want to advocate for teacher autonomy. And I say, yes, but there's about 10 to 15% of people that I don't know if I want them to have it, <laughs> but I would still rather the other 85 get it, you know, because you'll sort out the, you'll sort out the problems as they arise. Um, for teachers to be involved in the decision-making is great for teachers to have a little bit of freedom in how they're going to teach the content is great. Do you think that students belong in that conversation? Like, should we be including students in these decision-making processes? I certainly don't think that would hurt. I mean, they're the ones that are directly impacted in how their education is going to go. So finding a way to find out what they think is important or what's working for them is important. Yeah. I, I just, I recently talked with a principal. He's a retired principal. Uh, he's worked on four continents. He's been all over the place. And wow. he, um, he, he wrote a book a couple of years ago and it's called trust-based observations, which the whole idea is like change how you observe teachers. And the whole, his whole point is to encourage them to try something new. He's like, so if I go in and I observe and the teacher's like, yeah, I've never done that before. He said, that the discussion is about how that went. And I, I high five them and I quit checking boxes on the form because I want the teachers to feel empowered to do these things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and he had this, he had this great mindset and the whole approach is really good. And I asked him as we were finishing, I said, you know, do you ever ask the kids what they think of their teachers? And he goes, well, if you're in there, you kind of get a feel for it. And I said, well, but trust me, the kids behave differently when you're in the room than when you're not. And I said, do you, do you ever ask him? He goes, well, now I know what I have to put in the second edition of the book. And I was like, well, sorry, sorry <laughs> to do that to you, you know? Um, but sometimes I think, you know, that, that students could have a voice in some of this too. Um, obviously, you know, you have to be careful with maturity and the rest, but, but they are why we're doing what we're doing. And so if we can include them, that might be good. But yeah, I, I like the idea of teachers involved in the decision-making process. I think that would be important. So before we sort of wrap this up and we'll do some, some book and movie recommendations and anything for fun, I'll give you a, a moment for an open mic. Is there anything that we either talked about that you feel like we didn't do justice to? Is there anything that we didn't get to that you'd like to comment or you just want to deliver a message to anybody listening? Is there anything that you'd like to say that we didn't already address? Well, I just really appreciate this platform because I think um, I was really able to address and you pulled out, you know, we pulled out the, um, some really topical things that are really uh, most, you know, returning to in-person instruction. So I really appreciate that platform and making sure folks know it's not a matter of people not wanting to teach, not wanting to be in the buildings. It's wanting it to be safe for, for themselves, for their families, and for their students. So I think that's really important and it doesn't get said enough. And I think people who are pushing to get students back in buildings, that's a, that's a message they need to hear repeatedly. It's not that they don't, these people don't want to be teaching and they think, and it's easier to do that from home. It's that they want to make sure it's a safe situation for everyone that's involved in those buildings. Yeah. And in terms of collective bargaining, just so people kind of have an understanding of where that is and kind of the next steps, I think it's really important for people to know because people, whether they're members or not, lots of people are really paying attention and really excited about the possibilities of that. Yeah. And I, I think that a lot of this, Again, that's sort of the point of the podcast is to try to have a, a thoughtful conversation about all the different ways that we can improve what we're doing in schools and in education overall. And I don't know, I just heard so many people accusing teachers, you know, oh, they're just doing it for themselves. They're not, they don't care about the kids. It's like, that's, that's like the most insane thing ever. Like you can disagree with the teacher's specific decision. You can say, I don't think that particular thing is best. But when you make an assault sort of overall and say they don't right. care, like who would choose this job if they didn't care? You know, that that's that's a that's a crazy thing to say. But I think that's an indication that people are stressed, people are, you know, reacting to a lot of different things in their lives, a lot of changes. And so I, I think in a couple of years, a lot of people will look back and including some teachers, you know, I think people are going to look back and say, you know, I maybe said some things that weren't entirely reasonable. And so one of the goals in this conversation, both with you and sort of overall in doing the podcast, say like, 
when you give people the time to really explain, I think we realize that most people have good motivations and good intent. Um, and I, I know that, you know, most of what I've heard from you comes in email form or, or snippets of what I hear in a school board meeting. And so being able to really hash out some of these things in more than the two minute limit or in more than a four paragraph email is really nice just because sometimes the context gets lost in those formats. And so I, I appreciate you taking the time to do this, like I said, because you know, I know a little bit about a bunch of these things, but I probably don't know enough about all of them. And and so it's nice to be able to dig a little deeper. So a little bit, maybe just for fun, but it, it can be dealing with education. I ask everybody I talk to for a couple of recommendations of books and movies that you like. And some people give me the teaching books and some people just list off the best action movies of the last year. So what kind of things do you like, or do you think that listeners uh, should maybe check out? Well, I, I, one thing as a teacher, and I've read this book every year to my students, is Wonder when I was teaching third grade. So it's an awesome movie and a great book that just has a great um, message of acceptance. And it's just full of lightheartedness and serious topics. And um, it really, every year I've used it with my third graders, has been really um, telling to me how sympathetic some of these kids are for Augie, who's the main character in this book. So, and it's been very popular over the past several years. So I'm sure lots of people have already read it and um, used it in their classrooms potentially, but that's a book that I highly recommend. Um, the other books that I'm going to mention are books that um, when Dave Clancy, our past president, he um, developed some book clubs and he had members running book clubs. And they've been, they were really powerful to me because I was reading books that I would have never picked up uh, um, picked up before. One's called The Coldest Winter Ever. And it's about this African-American girl and her life, which is nothing like the life I had growing up in suburbia and Wheaton, Maryland. Um, you know, just the tough life she had and the crazy decisions she made. And I remember, I don't know how many times I started the book and put it down, but I can't read this. This is, this is crazy. And then the more I had to think is that this is a, work of a book of fiction, but it's, it's based on reality. I mean, there's people live some of these crazy things happen to people in their lives. And that is something I just had never picked up a book to read something that was that far gone and really, in my mind, kind of a scary way to have to live. So that was a book, The, um, the Coldest Winter Ever. American Street was about a, um, another family in a very different situation that was just kind of eye-opening to me, things that I hadn't experience I hadn't experienced growing up or known people to experience growing up. And over the summer, there were several book clubs that the association did, and one was White Fragility. And that's a really um, powerful book that really just makes you think about the way you think of things and the way um, you act. You may think that you're very open-minded and don't have prejudices and you aren't acting in a certain way to any group of people. And the book kind of teases a part for you of, you know, you probably grew up, it kind of highlights for you, you may have been grown up this way and now you're thinking these things and they're really clouding um, the way you look at your life now and you look at others now. So it was just very eye-opening to me and just kind of brought it in my experience and my awareness of my own thinking and good, yeah. my own way of behaving. And across a couple of these, you know, it's nice because I, I always tell my students, you don't know what you don't know. You know, and so it's sometimes it's, it's, I have very little tolerance for willful ignorance, you know, when, when you have the ability to learn and you just, I don't want to know, like, that's not what I want, but it's hard. It's hard to be critical of someone who doesn't know something and they didn't necessarily have the opportunity to learn it or to see it. And so for some books like this, you know, where it's like, if I have the book, I have the time to read it. And I say, no, I don't want to, cause I don't want to learn that. That's different. But saying, oh, I didn't have awareness, and then I read the book and it changes my mind. Like, I think that's the telltale sign of a person who is is good or trying to be good, you know. And so, a book like I, I haven't read White Fragility. It was recommended to me. I over the summer I read. Actually, I don't know if I finished it. Still, we got into school. I got so busy, but I, I got through most of How to Be an Anti Racist by um, Ibram. Is it Zendi? Yeah, I'm not sure how to name. pronounce his. Last I, I think it's Zendi, yeah. but. Um, it that that was really good. And a lot of it, I was like, okay, yeah, I've I've read this or learned this elsewhere. But there were some of the personal stories, and I thought were really good. And I know that a lot of people over the summer were reading both of those. So White Fragility might might go back on my list as sort of an addition. Um, I will tell you, White Fragility is an easier read than How to Be an Anti Racist. I did start that book, and I didn't finish it. It was much more. Uh, I don't know. Taxing to me in some way, and I guess it, maybe it was more of a. I don't know. I think I tried to explain it to somebody else and I couldn't explain. Somehow I was able to 
read White Fragility and kind of connect to it more quickly. I think maybe um, how to be an anti-racist kind of required a whole lot more thought. It wasn't just reading and making connections as you went. It was more needing to reflect as you were going. Yeah, he he, he goes hard right from the beginning. And so we did, right. I, I got the audio book and we were like going on family family vacation or something in June. And I was like, all right, well, everybody's going to sleep. And I put it on. And we were like, you know, it was 15 minutes in before I realized my wife was actually awake. And I looked and she looked at me and she shook her head. She's like, what? I can't keep up. I don't, what is going on here? And it wasn't because she didn't want to engage in the idea. She was just like, I don't, this is, this is like a tough one to get through. I said, this one might've been easier to actually read than listen to. Um, but yeah, I've heard very good things about white fragility. The others I haven't, I've heard of wonder. I haven't read, um, but I've heard good things from some friends who teach elementary school. I haven't heard of the other two, so I'll check those out. Um, those are awesome. I didn't mean to cut you off. I just, I thought that the no, white those, those are really, my list. yeah, I say I thought it was just, it was really timely. And I know there's some other books that people are reading for similar purposes, but maybe come out with a slightly different, different outcome. Um, just totally for fun. What's your favorite movie of all time? My favorite movie of all time, probably the princess bride. Nice. It's one I know way too, I, and I'm kind of similar with lots of people. I can drive other people crazy as I'm listening to it because I'm quoting a whole lot more of it. Than <laughs> you can recite it. That's good. Um, all right. Well, Sandy, I really, really appreciate you taking the time to talk. I know that um, it's a busy time in general and, and maybe one of the busiest years that that the LEA has ever had. So I, I know that this wasn't easy to schedule and I appreciate you taking the time to, to share your ideas. Um, if people want more information about the LEA, maybe how to join or how to contact people on the board to get more information, where should they look to get in touch with LEA leadership or where do they go to find out how to get more involved? So we have a... Um a website. So we have the LEA website. We also have the LEA Facebook page and people are more than welcome to reach out to me. My email address, address is president at loudonea.org. All right. Um, so I'll link to all of that when I put this up on the website and this goes out sort of all over the place. And um, obviously if I get any questions that I don't know, I'll, I'll be passing them along to you or to, your, to your staff. Uh, Cause sometimes I get some really interesting like questions or comments back on the episodes and I love to have the answers, but I would rather say I don't know and help someone get the right answer than, than lie and give them the wrong one. So <laughs> right. I'll, I'll, I'll link up all the, all the social media and the website so that people can go straight to the source. But again, I, I appreciate the time. So for everyone listening, this has been uh, the ClassCast podcast. We've been talking with Sandy Sullivan, the president of the Loudoun Education Association. You can find the ClassCast podcast at www.classcastpodcast.com and on all major streaming platforms, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, et cetera, et cetera, and YouTube. We look forward to hearing any comments or questions that you may have as a result of the conversation. And I hope that everyone has a wonderful day. Thank you.